just a moment now for prayer as we bow our heads. Dear God, we are thankful to Thee for the privilege that we have of assembling together once again. And we would ask that Your blessings be upon us tonight to save the unclean and to heal those who are sick and afflicted and to bless those who are blessable tonight. And may we have a great outpouring of Thy Spirit. Yes, amen. Bless the ministry, brethren. Tomorrow being the Sabbath, and we're to go forth tomorrow to, to witness for you throughout the city. And we pray that you'll bless every pulpit in this city, and the adjoining cities, and around the world. And may the ministers be a new light to the people. And grant, Lord, that many great miracles will be wrought tomorrow through the name of thy Son, the Lord yes. Jesus, in their pulpits, in the ministry throughout the nations. Give us likewise tonight, Lord, something extraordinary Amen. that these dear people who have come to the rain and mud to come to hear the gospel May they go home light-hearted and rejoicing with a satisfied soul that they have been in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Grant these things, Father, for we ask them in the name of thy child. Amen. You may be seated. Some have said today that many called on the telephone telling of their experience of healing last night in the audience. And some of them has been saying that they uh, was not even on the platform, they were just sitting in the meeting and sometimes in the day they recognized that the sickness that they had was gone. Amen. So I like that. Here we can't say then that so and so certain ministers laid their hands on me and see God gets all the glory. And I just love that when God gets the glory because it's all to His glory that we're intending for Him to receive. All for His glory. Now in the Bible tonight we wish to take a little text just for a few minutes. And now tomorrow night is the closing of our little campaign, just three nights to kind of get acquainted with you people. And then it seems strange, just the time we get acquainted, then we say, well, uh, see you some other time. It seems like it's been that way now for the last 12 years around the world, just get acquainted and heard. If God is willing, and when I come back from overseas this time, I'm going to try to get me a tent or something so you don't have to hurry out of the city. Just set it up and stay there a while. And I'm sure it will be better because you'll... If people doesn't know just how to take a hold of divine healing, there's more to it than just walk up and say, I believe and walk away. If a patient has a, something like a tumor or something of that order, that patient will feel better right away, but within about 72 hours will get sick and there was. Because that lump or whatever it is, the life that was in that lump is dead. And the lump's still there. So it begins to, to break up. And then what it does, the heart pumps the blood and the blood purifies the body, so it's that's in a fever. And the patient seems to think, oh, I've lost my healing. Well, this, the faith that can take the life out of the tumor, unbelief will bring it back again. There they lose their, their healing. They just don't know the approach. But remember, in dealing with like the substance of tumor, we're not dealing with that lung or the cancer. What is a cancer? It's a lie. And it's not your life, it's another life. It's a multiplication of cells. 
And what caused it to be there? It's another life that's come into yours to kill you. The Bible calls it a devil. We call it cancer today, which is a medical term, which comes from the word crab. But the Bible calls it a devil, a killer. Now, we're not dealing with that little house that is growing. It develops cells just like you did. Did you know you came from one little cell? That cell came from your father. The germ went into the egg, which was your mother. And out of there, the cell began to swell the cell on top of cell until it made you what you are today. And now that life that you have in you now, through these cells, are good cells, cells of your life. But here comes a cancer, a tumor, or any other disease along. And it's a different cell and a different germ. And what is it to do? It's not, if it's against your life, then it's death. So it is a demon. And we're not dealing with that growth that it lives in that house. We're dealing with the life that's in that house. Just like if I was dealing with you, if you were the cancer. And not be trying to just rub your body until it's no more. But just take the life out of it. It'll go back to the dust of the earth. That's what casting out demons is, is calling the life of that out. The substance is still there, the body, but what happens to a little animal if it gets killed? What happens to a deer, you hunters up here, if you kill it today and throw it on the scales and weigh it? You tell your comrade that your deer weighs so much, but put it on the scales in the morning and see what it will weigh. Pounds lighter. Anything does, it shrinks for so long until corruption begins to set in, then it swells. And it gets heavier and bigger than it was in the first place. That same thing happens to a tumor or cancer. Then the patient begins to say, well, I've lost my healing. The best sign in the world that you've got. And that's why many times running in like little meetings like this, we don't get a chance to have those afternoon meetings of instructions and telling people how to hold to God. We just got to take a chance on the people having faith regardless of how they feel or what evidence of anything reoccurring, they still believe it. Stay right with it. That's the main thing. Now, I want to read some of God's blessed words. That's found tonight in the book of St. Matthew, the 40, the 12th chapter and the 42nd verse. And the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. May the Lord bless his word. Jesus, in the previous chapter, had just been upbraiding the cities because of their unbelief. You know, unbelief is one of the most hideous things that can strike a person. And there is only two faculties that can govern you. That's either faith or unbelief. You cannot be halfway between. There's no black white birds or drunk sober man, sinner saints. You're either a believer or not a believer. And the only sin that there is, is unbelief. You might be ever so religious and never tell a lie. You might be such a church member to all the neighborhood would say, what a renowned person and still be a sinner in the sight of God. You're not judged by that. It's by your faith. He that believeth not is condemned already. If, if righteousness is what pleases God, which it does, but all that God requires, the Pharisees were found blameless, but yet Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil because they did not believe him. That horrible thing of unbelief. And Jesus had done many works in the cities, 
And he said to them, O you Capernaum, who are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. If the mighty works have been done in you, that has been done in you, had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have been standing until this day. That great unbelief, self-styled, exalted into heaven, holier than thou art, that attitude. And Jesus had done mighty works in Capernaum, and they had called him Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And he was a brave man because of it. And I say this with respect. Friends and Christians, if God lets this nation get by, He just can't let it get by. With this awful wave of sin that's sweeping our nation. If God would let us go on in the way we are without judging, then he being just would have to raise Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for destroying them. With such a wave of sin of the same time, God is no respect of nation or people. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. And we are doomed. Just mark that you who are here taking notes that I said it. There is nothing left for America but judgment. That's all. So just get ready for it. But the church will be gone before the judgment comes. God promised it. We just had a few weeks to stay on those things, to build up to it. But listen, Jesus had said that if the works had been done in Sodom, that had been done in these cities, they would repent. And then we understand that God in all ages has had gifts and wonders that He's worked through calling the, the people. In every age, practically, God has had a servant or somewhere, a person sometimes, that He can lay His hand on. Our people. He's never been without a witness. And He never will be without a witness. As long as there is an earth. To bear witness. And he has been referring back to the days He said in the previous reading, like as in the days of Jonah, the prophet. And he was concerned because they had called the spirit that was in him Beelzebub. That means he was a, a demon power. And if you will notice, because he had discerned their thoughts and know what they were thinking, they never called him Beelzebub to his face. They wasn't even gentlemen enough to do that. They thought in their heart. And Jesus said he perceived their thoughts. They thought he was Beelzebub. And they were all upset because he didn't agree with them in their theology. And some came to him after all he had done and said, We would seek a sign from thee. And he said, A weak and an adulterous generation will seek after a sign. And there will be no sign given this adulterous generation except the sign of Jonah. For if Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights, the Son of Man will lay in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. Before we get to our text or what I wish to say, I would like to examine that quotation from our Lord. They were seeking a sign, and He said that a, a weak and adulterous generation would seek for a sign. And I believe that our Lord was referring to this generation. All scriptures have compound meanings. Any student knows that. 
For instance, in Matthew 3, when he said that it might be fulfilled out of Egypt, I call my son. If you'll run the records to that, it was his son Israel. But it also pertained to his son Jesus. Scriptures have compound meaning. And Jesus said that a wicked and weak generation of adulterers would seek for a sign. Now I want you to listen close. He said they will receive a sign. And that sign will be the resurrection sign. The resurrection for as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And when God gave Jonah the commission and he went down to, to Nineveh, he found the ship at leisure, so he couldn't get his ticket and his fare maybe down to Nineveh, so he just went to Tarshish. And they found out that he got in trouble. I think that's what's the matter with the Christian church tonight. We're in trouble. We've tucked the wrong road. And God's not in trouble. It's the church that's in trouble. God wants us to be all one. Wants us to have fellowship one with another. While the blood of His Son Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But we draw little walls and say, No, we will not cooperate in such a meeting. No, we can't do this because our church is not in it. Oh, what a weak, petty thing. Like little juveniles. And notice then the ship began to rock and Jonah was in trouble. And they bound his feet and his hands and threw him overboard. And God had a great big dish all prepared to swallow him. I've always had a deep sympathy for Jonah. He was in a terrible condition, yet he was a prophet of the law. Now anyone knows that a fish crowding through the water is hunting for its prey. And as soon as it has eaten, it goes to the bottom and rests itself with the swimmers on the bottom of the water, of the pool. Feed your little goldfishes and watch what take place. He'll go right down to the bottom of the pool and there rest himself. And here was this fish after he swallowed this prophet down at the bottom of the sea, many fathoms deep. And let's just notice tonight, you people in the wheelchair, and you that some crutches maybe feel like that you can't be well. We have never come into any situation like Jonah was in. The first place he was backslidden. And he had his hands tied and his feet tied and he was in the whale's belly way down in the bottom of the sea and a star on the sea. If he looked this way, it was the whale's belly. If he looked backwards, it was the whale's belly. All around him was whale's belly. You talk about a good case of symptoms, Jonah had it. I don't think that any of us could have that kind of symptom. But you know what he said? He knew God. Amen. And he said there are nine vanities I won't even look at. Right. For he knew that when Solomon dedicated the temple of God, that he prayed and said, Lord, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and look towards this holy place and pray them here from heaven. And he had confidence under those symptoms to have confidence in the prayer of Solomon and believe that God heard the prayer of Solomon. symptoms, 
come to her call. He just ignored it and went on. But when she went to see him, seemingly she could have said, Why did you not come when I called you? If she would said that, she would have never got what she asked for. But she went with respect and she said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. That's the way it must come. It must come because that it's your respect. She was respecting it. She knew that the Shunammite woman went to Elisha and got what she desired. And she knew if God was in the prophet Elisha, surely he was in his son Jesus. Some time ago, there was a woman who said to me that belongs to a denominational church who doesn't believe that, that Jesus was any more than a prophet. Friend, he was more than a prophet. He was either God or the greatest deceiver this world's ever had. He was divine. And this certain woman said to me, Mr. Brandon, you put too much brain on Jesus being divine. I said, he was divine. And I cannot brag half enough on him. And she said, if I'll prove to you by the Bible that he was not divine, will you accept it? I said, certainly if the Bible said so. But I don't believe you can prove it by the Bible. And she said, in St. John, the 11th chapter, the Bible said when he went down to the grave of Lazarus, he wept. Said, you see, he could not be no more than a human and then weep. I said, sister, your argument is too thin. He was both God and man. Amen. And when he went to the grave of Lazarus, he wept like a man. But when he stood and pulled his little frame together and said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man that had been dead four days stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man. He was a man when he come down off the mountain was hungry, looking for something to eat on that tree. It was a man when he was hungry. But it was more than a man when he'd taken five biscuits and two pieces of fish and fed five thousand. That was more than a man. He was a man when virtue had gone from him all day and he laid on the back of a little ship and the waves were ten thousand devils of the sea swore they had drowned him. And he had been asleep and got tired. He was a man. But when he put his foot on the prayer of a boat, looked up and said, Peace be still. And the winds and the waves obey him. That was more than a man. He was a man when he cried to Calvary for mercy. But he proved that he was God when he broke the seals and raised from the tomb and declared himself to be the resurrection. He was God made manifest in the flesh. God in him. And that Martha, she respected that and believed it. And in the days of his flesh on earth, many respected and received his reward. But he was telling these people of other great people who came on the earth and how they respected it and what they got and those who turned it down, what they got. And now in the days of Solomon, God had given this gift and all the churches rallying around him. The news must have swept throughout all the countries. And I just wonder, in this last days when the Holy Spirit is coming down, a great revivals are hitting the nation like Billy Graham, Jack Schuler, and Oil Robertson, many of those great evangelists. And God doing great signs and wonders before the people. Would it not be wonderful if all would put their hearts together and rally around that? While all the world would come to Christ in one year's time or less. But we just split up in divisions. And as long as they're shooting at each other, Satan just steps back and lets them unload their guns. So if we can get together and put our hearts together, our efforts together, and our prayers together, we'll get somewhere. 
So they respected that great gift of Solomon that God had given Solomon. And here he was in the temple doing things and the people, all the passerbys must have thought, oh, this is a great thing. And everybody, no one talking against it, everybody for it. They said, our brother Solomon, God has given him a great gift and oh, you should come and see it to all the people who came by. And the news spread everywhere. And way down into the south, in the land of Sheba, a little queen down there, a little pagan queen, everybody seemingly come by her place would say, you should see the great things that's going on in Israel. Great mighty wonders are being done by a gifted man from their God. One by the name of Solomon. Oh, his wisdom is unmatched. His discernment is perfect. Never case fails. He's just perfect on it. You know, faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God. And you know, the Bible said that we are the salt of the earth. And if the salt is still got its Savior in it, in contact, it is a Savior. But if the salt has lost its strength, if our testimonies are so irregular, one day we're up, the next day we're down, this way we're bleeding, the next day we're not, how can the sinner man find anything from us? See, we must take our stand for God and never remain until death sets us free. And this little queen hearing this, she said, Oh, I wonder if that really is true. So finally she made up in her mind that she'd go and see for herself. I like that. Just don't take somebody else's word about it. Come find out for yourself. Like Nathaniel did last evening in our message. So as the enthusiasm began to draw her closer, the time came when she said that she was going. Now remember, she had a lot of opposition against her. She was a pagan. And what do you think the bishop of her pagan church would say? If she told him that she was going up into another country to hear another preacher, what do you think taking place? Now, she had all of that to confront. Well, maybe the pope of her church or some bishop or something of, these, of her temples would say, Now, just a minute, queen. You will pollute our whole nation if you go there. But you know there's something about it that when God goes to speak into your heart, there's nothing can stop it from finding out what's called. When God goes to call. And she would say to the priest, I suppose, Sirs, I'm just going up to find out for myself. Here we are here worshiping an old bunch of dead creeds that's been handed down to us and we see nothing else but some of theology and some writing on some tablets or something. But they tell me that their God is real and manifest himself right out before the public. I like that kind of a God. Not a God of history, a God that's present tense. A God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was yesterday, he is the same today. In every way. And she said, I want to go find out. Well, if you go, we'll excommunicate you. Well, you just as well get ready for it. I'm going anyhow. So she said, now, if I go and I find out that it's true, then there's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to support it with everything I've got. So she laid down some camels with gold and myrrh and frankincense and costly things. But first she kept her gifts until she was going to find out whether it was the truth or not. Whether it's just a little fly of night or a little some kind of emotion had raised up. She wanted to know what it was the truth. If all these things she had heard by the word if they were made manifest and proved to be right, then she was far. That's a good, sensible approach. 
If the word says so, or something promised, and that promise is kept, then there's nothing to say, but you must be or be turned aside, unalienated. Notice, and she laid her candles and got everything ready to go. And now remember, she had a long journey before her. She just didn't have to come from across the city. She had to travel about three months over a burning desert. Measure the distance from Palestine down there. And she didn't have an air-conditioned Cadillac either. Or some great air-conditioned coach to come in. But she had to sit on the back of a camel. But in her heart, something in there was calling. She's on her road regardless of the circumstance. And if God would speak to you tonight that He's dead and He's the God that healed you, there is no one to talk you out of it. And if He whispers to the sinner that you are saved and I am your Savior, there's not enough doctors of theology in the country to explain it away from you. You know it. Every believer has a sacred sand or a backside of the desert where he can put his finger, there I met God. If it's just theology, they can explain it away from you. But they can't when you've had that experience of meeting God and your life has changed. So something had happened to her. The deep was calling to the deep. And if the deep calls to the deep, there's got to be a deep to respond to it. As David said, at the mouth of thy water spouts, the noise of thy water stops, rather. If there's a deep in your calling, there's got to be a deep to respond to it. Before there was a fin on a fish's back, there had to be a water first for you to swim in. To use that fin or you wouldn't have no fin. Before there was a tree to grow in the earth, there had to be an earth first to grow in. Or there had been no tree. Which was first, a sinner or a savior? Which was first a sickness or a healer? Blessed be his holy name. He was first. Amen. Or was a savior to express himself in his life. Let it happen. Yes, sir. To magnify himself to his subjects. To let them know that he is. Notice. Here some time ago I read a piece in the paper where a little boy beat the razors off of a pencil at school. And the teacher sent word to his mama and told her about it. And one day, to the mother's surprise, the little lad was out on the back porch getting the pedal off of a bicycle. So she got an arm. And she got the little lad and took him down to the clinic. And the doctors gave him an examination. They come to find out that his little sister needed sulfur. Now, sulfur is found in rubber. Now you see, before there could be a crave for sulfur, there had to be a sulfur to respond to that crave where you never had a crave. Amen, that's right. And you are here tonight because you believe there is a God that can heal. And before there is a creation, there has to be a creator to create that creation. And the very reason that you're here is a sign that there is a fountain open somewhere. Yes, sir. Amen. Or you never had the desire to come. Something is pulling. It's a creator God trying to bring you to the presence of His being to let you recognize that it's His goodness and mercy to you. And it was the same God who spoke to the little queen. To let her know in the sincerity of her heart that he was God. And she had decided to go regardless of the cost. And she knew that she had supported. That's the way it 
if it's right, support it. If it isn't, have nothing to do with it. So she laid in some camels. And another thing she had to confront. With all that wealth, she had to cross the desert. Now just think. Of three months on the desert. And some people in Hartford won't come across the street to see the same. Oh, it's too rainy. Oh, my church is not cooperating. What will it be in the day of judgment when that little queen stands with you? That's right. What will it be when Solomon stands? And when Jonah stands? And all men who repented at his preaching? If you understand the history, the God of Nineveh was a whale. And when the whale brought the prophet out before the fisherman is spitting out on the bank, a miracle. No, things are probably true. It was God's will that Jonah went out there like that. He had to show a miracle. And that's what he's doing now, showing a miracle. The resurrection of his son after 1900 years, he remains the same. And the wicked and governance generation see it. What will they be in the day of the judgment when those of Nineveh who didn't know right and left hand repented at the preaching of Jonah? How much greater is it now? And the little queen, she started off now another thing. She had all that wealth. And the children of Ishmael were on the desert and they were robbers. What a setup! Why, they take that great group of fleet-footed riders with their spears and riding on their little caravan there and murder them and have all that wealth to themselves. She had that to confront. Now, you don't have that to confront to come across the street or around the city or for some nearby place. You don't take it three months through a hot, boring desert sitting on the back of a camel. Now, in all sincerity, I wonder tonight how many presents would take that same journey. Think of it. But she didn't be in a pain in hearing that there was a living God who had presented a gift to the earth. She'd come to see the gift of God working through a man. And she took off on her journey, leaving her friends, her priests, her everything behind because God was tugging at her heart. No wonder Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. All of Hartford won't be saved. There will be millions of church members throughout the world who will just perish with the world. Now remember, but God has elected that some are going to be saved and there's not enough power in hell to keep them from coming to Jesus. And God will manifest Himself just the same. He's manifest Himself. The whole world has a chance, but they won't receive it. Jesus said so. Straight is the gate that leads to life. Broad is the way to destruction, and many there will be going, and few there will be that will be saved. As it was in the days of Noah, and in the days of Lot, so would it be in the coming of the Son, and there's nothing can break that. That's said in His God and it's His Word just as eternal as He is. Now, here she comes. And she didn't come and say, I'm going over in 16 minutes. And if I don't like the way that preacher Solomon preaches, I'm going to get up and get out. If he says anything contrary to our theology, I'm going to leave. I just want to stand and listen to it. That would be the 19 and... 58 version of it. <laughs> I'll see if he says anything contrary to our creeds. She didn't say that. I can't go for one night because we got to have a card party and we got to set up on this night to see what is that television? We love Susie or something like that. <laughs> Could you imagine hungry hearted people staying to watch such Tommy Rod is that and Arthur Godfrey and Elvis Presley and calling themselves Christians and listening to such nonsense as that? 
It shows what's in your heart. The Bible said if you love the world, all the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. No sheep come not to stay just an hour or to one night service. She made her camp and stay there till she was convinced. I like that. She come to stay till it was over. She just brought her maidens and all, and she just pitched camp and stayed there. I can see her out in the courts, and they said, when's the next meeting going to be? It's just ended tonight, Queen. But Solomon, or is he a saint? No, he's just a man. Is he holy? No, he's a holy God dealing with him. Well, I'd like to see who he is. Just go over to the meeting in the morning. You'll see him. Now I see the little queen get herself a seat and sit down, and Solomon came out. And all the people around were talking, oh, it's a small thing. You should see our God working through our brother. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have a church like that? Wouldn't that be wonderful to have even uh, our nation working together in harmony and knowing our God still lives, reigns just as same as he ever was, doing the same things? The nations from everywhere would flow in here. So we got communism. I feel sorry for them. It's because of the weakness of the churches in Russia what made communism hatch out. Amen. Sitting right in this building tonight, I believe. Mrs. Isaacson, my Finnish interpreter, that was there in Finland when a vision came forth, and that little boy was raised from the dead laying on the side of the road which a vision was told two years before it happened. And that night when 25,000 in the mess of hall and then turned that 25,000 out, let me speak to another 25,000. When I was going down the street, there stood Russian soldiers. And when I passed by a little Finnish soldier trying to protect me from the crowd and get to the mess of hall, they stood with the Russian salute with tears running down their cheeks. And they said, we will receive a God like that. Sure, a God of power. But their creeds is no more than our creeds. And I've seen with my own eyes Russian soldiers put their arms around Finnish soldiers and pat one another on the back and kiss on the side of the neck and call each other brother. And any power that will make a Russian and Finn hug one another will settle wars forever. Christ is the answer. You'll never do it by passing traps or teaching theology. It'll be the power of His resurrection that'll prove to them that Christ still lives. She came to watch. I can imagine just before the service began, the nervousness of the little queen. She began to wonder, now, I don't care what happens, I'm going to stay for several days. I'm going to stay until I find out whether it's real or not. I will not go my conception maybe the first time. There may be something that happened this morning that I might not just understand. But I'll come back again. I'll stay till the service is over. I'll watch everything. And when the cases was brought before Solomon, and the Spirit of God was there to discern that case, that little woman watched. She waited. And when she had been fully convinced, she stood up one morning and she said, All that I heard was the truth, and more than I heard was the truth. For I have seen more than what anybody ever testified about. And Jesus said, She'll rise in the day of the judgment and condemn this generation of priests and church going people. And if she, Jesus said that about her in that generation, how much more today will that queen rise in the generation that we're living in and condemn this church-going bunch of people who would laugh and call the Spirit of God a mental telepathy or something? Oh, how critical hours we're living in. And now I want you to remember 
Jesus promised that the weak and adulterated generation would receive one sign, and that would be the sign of the resurrection. The Bible says that. And what is the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you declare him to be the same yesterday day and forever? To do the same thing that he did? Or to be called the same thing that he was? The Spirit of God being an unclean thing which would condemn the generation of unbelievers and save the generation that believed. The ones who laughed at Noah's rain coming. The rain drowned the wicked world and saved Noah. The same Spirit today that the world is calling fanaticism and some kind of devil name has been tacked on to the church. Say they're a bunch of illiterate, ATR, holy rollers, I've sailed the seven seas and traveled every nation on the earth nearly, and I've never seen a holy roller. There's no such a thing. It's a name that the devil tacked on to the church of the living God. Only a scarecrow. Where do you put a scarecrow on sour apple tree? That the birds had that. But the scarecrow is around the good tree that's valuable. And God has a tree that's valuable. That's His resurrected Son who's standing in our midst tonight in the power of the Holy Spirit to do and perform that which He did when He was here on earth. That's His Word, His promise. What are we going to do when we come? Will we stand and take our place as believers? If He will perform as He did. If He will show to us, as I said last evening, the same sign, that He proved to them that He was Messiah. If He'll do the same works, so that the world can say it's the devil or something like that, to condemn them and save you. I wonder if we'd stand. Take our position with Him. Some time ago across Central America, about 50 years ago, there was an evangelist, and I'm closing. And his name was Daniel Green. He dreamed one night that he died. And he went up to heaven. And when he got to the gate, the caretaker came out and said, Who art thou that's approaching this gate? He said, I'm Daniel Green. He said, I was a great American evangelist. I've helped save thousands of souls. But just a moment, sir, and he went in. Looked at the book, he said, I don't have your name, Mr. Green. Oh, he said, surely you have my name. He said, no, it's not here. He said, well, what can I do? He said, you might appeal your case to the great white throne judgment if you desire to. That's the only hope you have. He said, well, if that's my only hope, I must take it. And he said, he felt himself moving. He went through space for some time. After a while, he began to get light, lighter, lighter. And lighter he got, slower he began to go. And finally he come to a standstill. There was no certain place the light was coming from, but it was just everywhere. And he heard a voice. He said, oh, what a place to stand in. And he heard a voice saying, Daniel Green, I hear that you've appealed your case to my judgment bar. He said, yes, Lord. I have appealed my case to your justice. He said, I will judge you then according to my laws. He said, Daniel Green, did you ever tell a lie when you were on earth? He said, if I thought I did anything, would have been a truthful man. But said, in the presence of that life, I seen where I had said things that wasn't right. He said, yes, Lord, I, I did, I lied. He said, then, Daniel Green, did you ever steal? He said, I thought I'd been honest. But in the presence of that great light, I've seen a many little shady deal I pulled. And so will you and I. It might be all right sitting here in this school auditorium. It might be all right out there in your church, but in the presence of that light, there will be things that you have forgot about a long time will come up before you. There'll be a little time when you said, that bunch of holy rollers I had nothing to do with them. You forgot it a long time ago. But it's still there. It lives on. Oh, I think it's nonsense. I think it's a mental telepathy. It'll meet you at that judgment bar. 
sure will. How you judge him, you'll be judged there. And then he said, a voice came forth and said, Daniel Green, was you perfect when you were in life? Oh, he said, no, Lord, I was a long ways from being perfect. Said, I was expecting to hear the blast come forth. Depart from me, you horrible sinner. And said, felt like that every bone in me was coming apart. And I was listening to hear that great blast and to see myself sink into a devil's hell. And said, I heard the sweetest voice I ever heard in my life. And said, when I turned to look, I saw the sweetest face I ever saw. Said, no mother's voice or face could ever look so sweet. And said, he walked up close to me and put his arm around me. And he said, Father, that is true. Daniel Green was not perfect on earth, but there's one thing he did do. When he was on earth, he stood for me. And now here I stand for him. Oh, God, let that be me tonight. And all of my mistakes and all, let me stand for him. For that day I need him to stand for me. I wonder tonight if you were dying sinner friend, who would stand for you? Your pastor can, your mother can, or some saint can. It takes Christ and Him alone. Let us think of it while we bow our heads. Just a moment for prayer. You might have come to see a gift of God as the Queen of Sheba did. I'd like to ask you a question while you're praying. Would you say, search me, oh God, and see now? I've never seen this happen. But I've just arrived at the courts. I know there's nothing that little man standing on the platform. But I've come to faith expecting to see something happen. And I know that you'll do it. And Lord, I want to accept you as my Savior. And I want to stand for you right now. That at that day, you stand for me. How many of you in here that would just quickly, we can't call you up here, but you just raise up your hand and say, by that, God be merciful to me. God bless you, lady. God bless you. Oh, my. 30, 40 hands. 50. Yes, more than that, maybe. God be merciful to me. I now want to accept Christ as my personal Savior. I want to make this all-sufficient stand for Him right now. I believe that I'm in His presence. And I want to stand for Him so that He'll stand for me on that day. Would there be some more that would raise your hands? Up in the balcony, raise your hands. Young folks, you're right at the crossroads of life. Listen, sister and brother. Oh, this is your hour. God bless you, young man. That's a gallant thing. God bless you. God bless you over there. That's good. You say, Brother Brown, what does it do when I raise up my hand? It changes you from death to life. If you mean it, I'm taking your word and God will. You know, according to science, you can't move your hand. Gravitation is supposed to hold your hand down to your side. But when you defy gravitation... Raise up your hands towards your maker. It shows that there is a spirit in you that's made a decision. And you defy the laws of nature. You, God bless you, sir. You defy the laws of gravitation and you raise your hands towards a creator that you believe that made you, that made you and say, I now accept you, Lord, as my Savior. God put your name in the book the very minute you do it. You pass from death to life. Just look what's taking place in here tonight. What has it been? Pray now. Maybe there will be another, or maybe more, that would like to bow raised hand while everybody their heads bow praying. God, I now raise my hand not to the preacher, but to you, Lord. I'm convinced that you're the Son of God, and I'll just be my Savior. And I'll raise my hand to stand for you tonight. Put up your hand, will you, while we pray? Now, God bless you back there, sir. That's very fine. And God bless you, little one. Maybe God has never, even you've never seen the Holy Spirit move in power, but you're just accepting it beforehand. 
Greater is he who has never seen and yet believed the resurrection. God bless you, sir, down here. Certainly. Now, are you finished? Uh, I just believe this, that God said no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up at the last days. St. John 5, 24 says, He that heareth my word, now he is a personal pronoun, not a church, a group of people, a person. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, present him, everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. Then the black cloud of death has sailed from over 50 or 75 people in here tonight. And the light clouds of life has come to me. Let us pray. Oh, blessed God, my heart is thrilled to see the little congregation of people, merely a handful, gathered out here tonight, and many of them who, just hearing the word, make their stand. They even come in greater than the Queen of Sheba. She waited to see the power of God working to Solomon. But these people have not waited. They believe the word and have made their confession of their wrong and have accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. Oh God, it's a new day and a new life for them. Bless each one of them. They are yours, Lord. Draw them through the preaching of the message, their trophies of tonight's message, and of thy grace. And now thou dost give them to thy son as a love gift. No man can pluck them from the hand. Someday, if I never shake those hands and raise tonight, I believe when life is all over. And the great table is set at the wedding supper. And the tears are running down our cheeks for joy that the king shall come out and wipe all tears from our eyes and say, Children, don't cry more. It's all over. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. I believe I'll shake hands with them there. God bless them. They're yours. Give to them the best that you have in your kingdom, Lord, for them. Grant that they live long lives and be healthy and happy and serve you all the days of their life. May they be lighthouses in the community where they live, in the city, in their churches. Grant it, Father, they are yours now. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I present them to you as the trophies of the message. Amen. Oh, there's something about the gospel that just scours you out. Do you feel that way about it? Amen. It's so simple, just so simple that it goes over the top of heads of people that are looking for something, some great something. But it's simple. Now we're going to call the prayer line and pray for the sick. And believe that God will heal the sick and afflicted that's in the building tonight. Now, I wish you would just remain as quietly as you can now. And how many in here feel real good in your soul? Just raise your hand. Oh, that's just fine. God bless you, my dear friends. Now, I want to ask you something. The Lord Jesus, when He was here on earth, and He promised in our message tonight that this generation that we're now living would see the sign of the resurrection. That would be the only sign that was given to the generation. Would be the sign of the resurrection. The scripture teaches that Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. How many share for your first time? He wasn't here last night. Let's see your hands all over the building. Well, it's a good thing that the crowd here last night didn't come back. Two thirds of them are newcomers. Now, Last night, I was speaking on, I suppose Dr. Bale has tonight, 
give you an explanation of how that Jesus claimed not to do any works himself, but it was through vision that he seen that his Father showed him what to do. Do you believe that? St. John 5, 19. Jesus said the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. That gives the Son like God. If you notice, we passed through a place where there's a great multitude, maybe several thousand people. Historians tell us that they lay in this pool of Bethesda, and when the angels troubled the water, they would stab one another trying to get in first to test their faith against the angel. And remember, the first one got healed, all the strength of the angel was gone for another season. They waited maybe for months. One man had been waiting for years. And Jesus passed through the same place where a few days before a woman touched his garment and he turned around. He said, Who touched me? And all of them denied it. And Jesus said, But I thought weak virtue went from me. And he looked around over the audience until he found the person that touched him. He said, Told her what her trouble was and her faith had made her way. Now that was Jesus yesterday. The Bible said he's the same today and a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. If that isn't true, then I, I would lay this book down and leave here. Because if it isn't the truth, I don't want nothing to do with it. But I found this, that every word is the truth. You can rest your soul. I may not have faith to make it all act right, but I believe it anyhow. I'll never stay. I might not have faith to walk like... Or Enoch didn't take the little walk and go home in the afternoon and not have to die. I may not have that kind of faith. I may not have faith enough to shout down the walls of, of the city like Joshua did. But I'll never stand in somebody else's way that has that faith. I, I'll thank God for that faith. What faith I have, I love him and ask for more. Now, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever... And the woman touched him, and he did not know, or he can't lie, he was God. So the woman touched him, and he said, who touched me? And Peter said, well, the whole multitude's touching you. That's what you're doing today. But he said, I perceive that virtue has gone from me, that strength, I got weak. And he looked down like the water was on the pool, the angel, rather, on the water. And said, well, uh, I got weak, so he found the woman and told her. Now, if he's the same... And the Bible said in the book of Hebrews, he now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How many Bible readers would say, Amen, just now? <laughs> well then, if he is a high priest, now he's got to act like he did then to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Yeah. Never until the Father showed him. Now, he told the truth, therefore he never performed one miracle until God showed him by a vision what to do according to his own word. St. John 5, 19. Search the scriptures. No prophet ever did anything at random. It's always God. No flesh and glory in the sight of God. And Jesus did not call himself a divine healer. No, he said, it's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He showed me or doeth the works. I just act out what he shows me to do. And he was standing in all the dudes of people. And people would come up to him. And he didn't know who they were and what their names were. Where they come from. What they had done in their life. How many know that? Would you say amen? amen? The woman at the well, he talked to her and he told her where her sin was. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? That woman knew more about God than half the preachers in the world today. Right. Being a prostitute. She was better called. She knew more about it than all the religious trained Pharisees of their days. They said, This is the devil. Well, this man, that's the devil. He's a fortune teller. But what did the devil say about it? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. How about up there when Jesus, when Paul and Silas was doing the works of God, and that little fortune teller ran out and said, Well, the preachers all said, These men are awful men. They turned the world upside down. That was a religious man. But this little old fortune teller said, They're a man of God who taught us the way of life. Who was right, the preachers or the devil? That's pretty flat, but that's the truth. <laughs> who was right when they hollered, Away with such a man, away with such a man. He's nothing but a Beelzebub. And the devil said, We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Why do you come to torment us before our time comes? Who knows the most? Kansas or the Satan? Satan. See, the 
just get so word bound, so church bound, till they can't accept the spiritual part of it. It goes over their heads. Look, when Philip went and found the family of God, he found him under a tree and he came to Jesus and Jesus is going to manifest himself before the Jewish race. And he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, Before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. What did he say? Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. He said, Because I told you that you believed. What did the woman say? This man told me the things that were done. Isn't this the very Messiah? That was the sign of the Messiah. Peter come, didn't know right and left hand, or he couldn't write his name, made him an unlearned man. He came up before the Lord Jesus, and Jesus looked at him, said, Your name is Simon. And from his voice you should be called Peter. Your father's name is Jonas. What do you think he thought? Certainly. That's Jesus yesterday. He manifested himself and declared himself before the Jews and the Samaritans. He's only three races. Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans. The Samaritans had Jew and Gentile. That's all Ham, Sham, and Jacob's people. Now he said, don't you go to the Gentiles, and neither did he go. But he waited for this age, and this is the end. The Gentiles have been heathens. Now they come through all this church age of reading the Bible and having schools and the, uh, theologians and so forth. And so, uh, now it's come down to the end. They ought to realize it. Now he's promised he would do it again if he declared himself and made himself Christ to them people and don't do the same at the end of the Gentile age that he isn't the same destiny today and forever. That's true. Now it comes to healing. I could come and line you people up here as you come by and lay hands on every one of you. That might be all right. I have nothing against that. My dear brother or Roberts and any other ministers do that. Your pastor anoints with oil. That's exactly scripture. That's their gift from God. This is another. But if you knew that the one who wrote this Bible was standing present in the church, working in the church. I remember he said a little while and the world will see me no more. Is that what he said? What is the world? The world order. They will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. That's the elected, the church. For I, personal glory, I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. The works that I do, shall you do also. Do you believe that? The works, the things that I do, so will you do also. I am the vine, ye are the branches. The vine do not bear fruit. It's only got the life to give to the branch, and the branch bears fruit. The church of Christ is the, is the branch. Now, if you go to the branch and don't find the fruit of the vine, then there's something wrong. It isn't in the branch of Christ Jesus. But if it's in the branch of Christ Jesus, it'll bear the fruits of Christ. You know what? How many years got prayer cards? Let's see your hands. How many doesn't have prayer cards? Let's see your hands. Wants to be prayed for. Raise your hands. Man hasn't got prayer cards. Hasn't got prayer cards and wants to be prayed for. Raise your hands up all over the building. About things where we are. Well, there's about 20 times, or about 20 times, there's many times more without prayer cards than is with prayer cards. I believe if you will bear with me just a moment, I'm going to put God to a showdown just now and see if He will do something for us. I'm going to take those who do not have prayer cards. And I just want you out there in the audience, and I'm going to want you up here. I want you out there in the audience, and we're going to give you a scripture. I'll take this scripture. Last night we took another. Tonight we'll take this scripture. That he is now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How many believe that with all your heart? Well, then, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you touched him tonight like that woman did, would he not have to act in the same way to be the same? If you did, then he'd have to act, and if he's living in the church, then he'll act just like he did back then. Now, let us pray just a moment, and each of you. Put on your heart and say, Lord God, I am now drawing a little line. And from this hour, the reason I'm doing this is because this whole group come to Christ just a few moments ago. This is something new. 
But the whole group came to Christ. And I'm going to believe that God is going to help this group of people tonight to see that Christ is out there with you. That He is the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Upon that scripture, the sin manifested. Now, Lord, it's in your hands. Now, we submit ourselves to thee, all this group of believers, and I am a servant. I, well, I just submit myself to you and the audience to you. These souls raised their hand and said they believed before they had even seen anything take place. Lord, the Christ that we have been speaking of, and as Give them the word of his promise that he would work in his church just as he did back there and would forever. Let it be known that this is the end of the Gentile age. And we are your church and you're working through us tonight. Give me faith, Lord. Give them faith. And may thy great name be honored. For we ask that in Jesus' name, Amen. Now let us just be real ready. There's no one going just be real ever. Sit still just a moment. And just, just like in your heart you were saying, now I know that the scriptures are true. And I'm going to believe God tonight with all that's in me. I'm going to believe that God is going to speak to me tonight. And I'm going to touch his garment. And he, by my faith touching his garment, Lord, you use Brother Bram's voice to turn and tell me just like you did the woman at the well. Just like that Christ did uh, in, in, his, in his time here on earth, and I believe that, that you're working through me and through Brother Bram. You just do that. See if he isn't the same. And if he is the same, and will prove that he is the same, will you all give him praise and glory for his goodness? Now just be reverent and pray. I have no idea, there's not a person before me that I know. I do not see, I believe this is a song leader sitting right here. Is that right? Are you a boy at least? I met down in New York. Now I believe that's Dr. Barton sitting right there. Is that right? Well, the rest of our group is on the platform. How many out there knows that I do not know you or know nothing about you? Raise up your hands to God so that you will see. All right. Now let his spirit, now he is the same, his spirit is working in us, which is a branch, then the great vine is here, the spirit vine. Then he begins to move through the outlets of our heart. Now what do we do? Just yield ourselves. Just like I said last night, this microphone is a perfect mute unless something is speaking to it. So when I be here, what do I know about you? I've never seen you. But it'll have to be a perfect view until the Holy Spirit does something for you and then comes here and speaks the thing through me. That's a gift of God that He promised. It's never been since the last apostle until this time. Search the history. Theologians and historians. Why? Because this is the end of the Gentile age. It'll go by. They'll never recognize it. Only the ones who are supposed to. Did you know they never know Elisha? They never know John. He's done, gone. Jesus said, that's the Elisha that was to come. They didn't know Jesus and he is dead, buried, and rose again. They didn't know St. Patrick. They call him a Catholic, but he is about as much as I am. They didn't know until he was dead. St. Francis of Assisi, a walking preacher with a Bible under his arm. Not until he was dead. Joan of Arc, they said she was a witch and burned her to a stake. 102 years later, found out she was a saint. Of course, they've done penance, dig up the dead bodies and throw them in the river. And the day is no less. If God sends it and he goes out of the people, he calls that when he is chosen. It's God, you know. I'm just waiting. I am perfectly helpless. God may not do it, but let us believe that he will. Because I don't know why this is something new. May he grant I just have to watch. We have it, the pictures. I don't think it was you. None of the pictures. It's hanging here in Washington, D.C. by the FBI, the only supernatural being that was ever photographed in all the world, the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. How many has ever seen the picture? Let's see your hands. All of the buildings have ever seen that picture. Some of you. We'll have it soon, but not now. We're completely out. It's not mine. It belongs to the American Photographer Association, the Douglas Studios in Houston. 
they cut it down there that night. We stood right there before 30,000 people. It comes out of the meeting.
But she thought it was the woman's son. Oh, she's sick. All right, lady, look at me. All right, look up here. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. She's in prayer for somebody else. Mary, that's her given name. She's praying for a daughter of hers. And that daughter has a mental break. That's what she's praying for. It happens to be you with your hands on her. You're a daughter too. That's right. Do you believe me to be God's servant? I don't know you, do I? If God will reveal to me what you're there for, or something to you, would you believe me as his servant? You suffer with arthritis. You do have it. That's right. Your name is Mrs. Bishop. That's right. You come from a place called West Hartford. That's right. Your house number is 167 North Main Street. Hartford, Connecticut. That's right. Believe me, I'm going home well. A challenge. This lady sitting next to me is praying too there. When I said arthritis to you, she's sitting there praying for her mother who has arthritis. That's right, isn't it, lady? Raise up your hand if that's right. All right? You believe in your mother will get well. Can't you believe? Anywhere. Just have it. Baby, don't doubt. Somebody over in this section, believe God. Here, look here, there's a light. See it there? The Holy Spirit. You say, do you see that, brother? That only thing I can say, I see the light that science put on a paper. He said, psychology, the camera won't take it. It's hanging over a man right there. He's got some guy with a little reddish little sweater on. He's praying for some loved one. And that loved one is a woman. And it's his sister. And she's in a mental institution. That's right. I'm a stranger to you, am I? I am. All right? You believe with all your heart. By the way, that's your wife sitting there next to you. Hmm? She's in trouble, too. She has a tumor. And she also has glands up. Her name is Ruth Edwards. That's true. And you're from Brookville, Massachusetts, both of you. That's thus saith the law. Go home, you're well now. If thou canst believe, if that isn't the Bible of Jesus Christ, his name yesterday and every day, I don't know the scriptures or neither do you. How great thou art. Just be there now. Something happened, but I didn't see where it was. Do you believe me with all your heart? All of me is so real, friend. How many with all your heart believe in our Lord Jesus? Now you know that has to come to a supernatural power. I have no way of doing it. It's God, it's your own faith, you're doing it. That's you doing it, you're believing it. I could not say a thing unless you are touching his garment. Here a few weeks ago in Chicago, there's a colored lady standing out. This is on record, all many. And she was praying for a loved one down somewhere in uh, Arkansas. And I said, you're, you've got the cirrhosis of the liver, but you're praying for your sister that's a maniac in an institution in Little Rock, Arkansas. She said, that's true, sir. I said, she's in a padded cell. I said, that's right. But I said, she's delivered. Or she's just now come to herself. And the next morning, the matron come in and let her out, give her this, this, and the following night, she flew to, to, to Chicago and had her dismissing card and stood and testified the following night. Certainly, that happens all the time. If thou canst believe, he's the same Jesus. Oh, how wonderful. The lady sitting here playing, praying. Her head's back. She's sitting right before me. She's got some flowers on her hand. 
Miss Rush, you I'm speaking to, if you just raise up your head a minute. That's you. Do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? Yes, you believe with all your heart? Do you believe the Lord God can give to you the things you desire? Well, God bless you. You were praying then for it. Certainly you are. Your trouble's in your throat. You got trouble in your throat, in your bowels, and in your spine. That's right. Correct me. You're not from this city. You're from Newport, Rhode Island. That is exactly right. I go back home, you're well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Do you all believe with all your heart? Raise up your hand and say, I now believe as the Queen of Sheba, as she sees the gift of God work in Solomon, it settles it with me. All right. The Lord bless you. I'm going to ask you to do something for every one of you to be healed. This going on, it makes me weak. You see it, though. Look at the perspiration from the hands and all. And now the whole crowd's just becoming like this. You're believing. I, if, you, if God has given me favor in your sight, believe me now, as a servant. I told you from the Word, He's confirmed that I'll tell the truth. And if I tell the truth on one thing, I'll tell it now. You're everyone already healed. And then healed for 1900 years, the presence of Christ confirms the word, and you are everyone healed. Do you believe it? If you do, the Bible says, These signs shall follow them to be. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Lay your hands on one another, and let's pray. I don't care what your trouble is. Let's believe God. Heavenly Father, we bring to you this audience. And we snatch them right out of the hand of the devil. Satan, you are, you are the deed. And the Holy Ghost has exposed you and declared that in this generation of the wickedness of this nation, yet there is people who's getting here tonight who believes on the Lord God. And they have seen his presence, knowing that it could not be a man to do that. That it is to vindicate the Bible and the resurrection. Oh Lord God, I pray that you will send the shower of the Holy Spirit and power over this audience that will shake every one of them to their senses to realize that the great Holy Ghost is here and has made them well. Grant it, Lord. Satan, I defeat you through the blood of the Lord Jesus. And his vicarious suffering in Calvary. You are defeated, Satan. Come out in the name of the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All of you that believe that you are healed by the power of God, stand up on your feet and give God praise. Don't be afraid. If you accept it, stand up. Give us a call and I will praise him, sister. Oh, isn't that wonderful? What about in the wheelchair? Are you afraid? Don't be scared. All right, man. Stands present to judge it and save it. 